Well, hello and welcome to another week's analysis behind the news. We're going to do something a little bit different today. Instead of focusing on a news event, let's discuss problem solving. Yes, yes, I know it sounds rather dry and boring, but let's give it a whirl as this may help to open up some eyes. So Independence Day is coming up in a couple of weeks, so it's a great time to read the Declaration of Independence as written by the Second Continental Congress, July 4th, 1776. Let's assume for the sake of argument that we have all read the document. Let's also assume that we have come into contact with plenty of others who have not read it. And when they have not read it, they do not either fully know or appreciate the reasons why America became an independent country. And if they don't know these reasons, how would they accurately know how to safeguard its independence? After all, shouldn't voters understand that there is a list of about 27 reasons that are stated by the Continental Congress and that voters should be familiar with them? So they aren't voting for those that would work toward giving us a similar environment that the colonies successfully broke away from? The same can be said of American history. If you learn in school that America is a democracy and all that is needed to change the direction of this country is a majority of voters, then you've missed out on why our republic is supposed to be safeguarding the rights of individuals and not bend to the whims of the masses. And why would we, why would we be taught something so misleading? Was it a mistake in the curriculum? Or was it deliberate? And if it was deliberate, then why and what else are we being taught that is wrong? Think of it this way, if I can get you to learn only partial facts of history, then I can get you to believe and act upon those partial facts. This helps to explain why younger generations are coming out of school hating America because of what they've been taught. They have been spoon-fed partial facts instead of being allowed to make their own thoughts and judgments from a much larger meal of truth. Now let's put this into context of politics. If we are taught and believe that the federal government is a positive force created to help improve our lives, then we are going to act and think in that realm, and we will have no problem in arguing for the government to provide us with entitlements. The truth and facts as we know it affects how we see and process everything. They shape our worldview, our voting habits, our fiscal responsibility, and even the future of our children. They also determine how we approach problem solving. For instance, if I only give you a portion of what is wrong, you will come to a solution that will best fit those set of circumstances. Yet it may be entirely the wrong solution for the whole problem. But when I give you the full context of the problem, your solution will reflect that. So if I asked you, how do we best save this country? then your answer will obviously be determined on what you already know, regardless of whether you studied it on your own or you heard it in passing from a trusted friend. If my worldview was that the USA owes a better living to its citizens and those around the globe, then I'm probably going to be a liberal advocate who sees wiggle room for reinterpretation of the Constitution. If my political worldview tells me that my civic duty consisted entirely of just voting for the lesser of the two evils, then I'm probably going to be a mainstream advocate who gets swallowed up in the two-party system, defending my party and arguing that the other party is who is ruining America. However, if I understand that there are organized groups pushing to use the government for their own means, much to the detriment of our liberty, then I'm going to have an entirely different set of solutions as I will clearly see beyond the hype of the two-party system. I may even begin to understand that these parties can be another tentacle of a much larger mass working to enslave me. And on that happy uh, word picture, let me introduce you to an educational tool that will certainly give you the worldview needed to ensure that you know the whole problem and not just bits and pieces of it. For when you understand the whole problem, only then can you attempt or can you can you attempt effective and long-lasting solutions this new tool is called to the victor go the myths and monuments the history of the first 100 years of the war against god and the constitution 1776 to 1876 and its modern impact it is written by our current ceo of the john birch society arthur thompson 
It has taken him more than 45 years to research and write this 544 page book. And on that, let me give you a little brief excerpt on what you can expect in here. I'm on page 359. It says, by 1864, the Union was nearly a complete dictatorship. Transportation and communications were for all practical purposes nationalized. The writ of habeas corpus was suspended. Military tribunals replaced civilian courts in a large portion of the north and border states. A secret police system existed in the military and the Department of the Treasury. Wiretapping was performed on the telegraph lines. Domestic passports were issued in order for citizens to travel in many parts of the country. And many military units were under the command of European and domestic communists. Indeed, the entire Department of War was under the leadership of renowned communists. Few have heard that the state of New Jersey passed a resolution in the legislature condemning the conduct of the war by the federal government and the creation of new states such as West Virginia. Further, the resolution contained this language. It says here, while, ab while abating not in her devotion to the union of the states and the dignity and power of the federal government, at no time since the commencement of the present war has this state been other than willing to terminate peacefully and honorably to all a war unnecessary to its origin, fraught with horror and suffering in its prosecution, and necessarily dangerous to the liberties of all in its continuance. This is from New Jersey Peace Resolutions, March 18, 1863. Mr. Thompson continues, the resolution detailed a long list of violations of the Constitution by the federal government in its conduct of the war. It is well worth reading for anyone who wishes to study just what has been happening uh, to American uh, liberty as a result of the war, and is wildly accessible online from reliable sources. Yet school history books give no mention of this resolution and the obvious sentiment among the people of sections of the North that belie the general storyline promoted. Not only was the state of West Virginia wrought out of Virginia with the help of the federal government, the state of Nevada was also brought into the Union during the war. The language required by the federal government to be in the Nevada state constitution to receive statehood read, says here, Section 2, Purpose of Government, Paramount Allegiance to the United States. The paramount allegiance of every citizen is due to the federal government, and no power exists in the people of this or any other state of the federal union to dissolve their connection therewith or perform any act tending to impair, subvert, or resist the supreme authority of the United States, or excuse me, of the government of the United States. The federal government may employ armed force in compelling obedience to its authority. This is still a part of the constitution of the state of Nevada, and the United States government still lies claim to about 80% of the land in that state. Contemplate the above in light of the so-called Obamacare legislation and presidential edicts emanating out of the White House that are more and more the norm and in violation of the law and the Constitution. It could place the state of Nevada in a position where the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution is null and void. Such required acts of obedience may have been arguable in light of the conflict under any other system of government, but not with the underlying principles of the Constitution of the United States. This was the sort of attack on state sovereignty that led New Jersey to issue its resolution. Now think of how different American education would be if that's what was taught. Especially the jealous relationship that states should have with the federal government regarding sovereignty. And of course, with this type of education, think of how much more protected states would be from a tyrannical federal government and how much liberty we all would have. But you won't learn that from history class, and for good reason. Learn more by going to shopjbs.org today and purchasing this book. Hardback copies are in stock starting today for $24.95 with a discount for bulk purchases. Until next week, we'll see you then.